Hello everyone, welcome back. You're listening to a brand new episode of The Millennial Athlete with Tanvi and Shlok, a podcast of for and by the millennials. I'm your host Shlok Ramchandran. And I'm co-host Tanvi Lard. And um, today we have uh, a very special guest on the show, straight from the bio bubble uh, at the Thailand Open. Uh, none other than uh, Hans Christian Wittingus, um, someone who's been a great role model for um, all of us on the tour. He's been as high as eight in the world, uh, and has and was part of the um, uh, the, the the Thomas Cup uh, team that created history in 2016. So, uh, really happy to have you on the show, uh, Hans. It's uh, all my pleasure. I'm so happy to be here. It's my first time doing a uh, a Indian podcast, so I'm uh, excited for it <laughs> and uh, looking forward to chat to you guys. Yeah. And to all our listeners uh, out there, uh, Hans was the inspiration behind us starting a podcast. I think it was the first podcast that I ever listened to. And then, of course, I got hooked on to listening to other uh, other genres of podcasting and then we got into it. So, yep, thank yeah, you now, for that. Now, <laughs> you, you guys have overtaken me completely. Like, your setup is so professional. I'm still just a happy amateur doing uh, my thing. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to inspire you guys and I'm uh, also a, a listener of your podcast. So, uh, yeah, you're just doing a great job. So keep it up, guys. Keep also, it. we have gone international today. So, yes, thank you, everybody. We have finally broken through the national barrier and we've gone international today. Uh, <laughs> Hans and I also share a deep Twitter connect. We are the only two active players who comment on everybody's match and uh, try to engage on debates. Uh, so, yeah. So, yeah. first of all, uh, Hans, uh, you know, you, you played the Denmark Open, which is great, but first tour uh, tournament where you've got all predominantly all the big names how does it feel back to be back on the asian tour uh, and you know badminton to be back yeah it's just amazing to be here like of course with the quarantine we have to uh, go through and everything things could be uh, better but we're not complaining at all because just being back in action and being able to compete with the best guys in the world i know the the japanese and chinese team unfortunately they had to pull out but being able to compete with everyone else is just, it's just an unbelievable feeling after having almost one year just ripped out of the calendar. Uh, yeah, it's just amazing. Uh, it's, it's hard to put much more words into it. It's just really the best feeling to be able to compete again. That's what we train for. That's what we live for. And uh, this, this week so far, or these past two weeks has just showed me how much I really missed it. Uh, I knew I missed it, but I realized even harder now how much I, I actually did miss it. I mean, also during the lockdown, uh, there have been uh, uh, Yele Maas retired, uh, uh, Matthias retired, uh, Mats Conrad retired. Uh, you're also in your late 30s, but you look uh, also belated happy birthday. Mm -hmm. You, you turned 35, but you still play like a 20 year old. Um, were there any doubts, uh, you know, when you, you didn't know, you know, where the next tournament is coming, any lack of motivation, but how, how was that phase for you? Did you ever feel that you wanted to maybe hang your boots? Yeah, actually, it was quite uh, fun or strange that going into 2020, uh, I had uh, agreed with myself and my coaches and my family that uh, I needed to kind of uh, make sort of a comeback, produce better results, try to make a push back into top 20 uh, in the world rankings. And if I didn't do that, I was uh, probably just going to... Uh, not qu quit completely, but at least tone it down and, and uh, start maybe doing uh, some other things. Uh, but then I didn't really get the chance as uh, everything got cancelled uh, from, from March. Uh, and I think the first few months was actually a blessing in disguise for me because I got a lot of time together with my family, uh, which I haven't had for uh, quite some years. I have a yeah, small son as well. Um, so I, I really enjoyed those first few months uh, back home. But when we reached about around summertime, it's kind of like I, I, I lost my way a little bit in training. Um, the fact that I didn't really have a goal that I could pursue in training, uh, something to work towards. Uh, we, we kept on hoping that Denmark Open would be on and Thomas uh, Uber Cup in, in October, but everything just got post, uh, postponed and cancelled. And yeah, I, I kind of lost track at, at uh, what I needed to work on and uh, yeah, why I should do it. So in, at that time, yeah, I, I kind of lost my way and I was a little bit in doubt again uh, of yeah what to do with everything. Uh, also, given my age, just turned 35. Um, but I had a really good chat with my uh, with my uh, coach, Kenneth Jonasson, about it uh, after having a couple of bad months in training with poor results. And 
now I just I just see it as a uh, of course it, it's it's not a real blessing because there's still one one year out of the calendar completely but I I see it as a thing that can maybe career because uh, um, I've had now the time to be home relax recharge the batteries and uh, with my body and uh, my age I think that that's not a bad thing necessarily um, so now I hope to continue for a few more years and I I definitely feel that my level is uh, is still there to compete with the uh, with the good guys. Absolutely, and we we hope to see you uh, on the circuit for the next few years at least. But uh, Hans, you mentioned um, Kenneth. I mean, we we know that he's he's played at the you know at that level um, with with Peter Gade, of course, uh, number two to Peter Gade, and he's uh, been national coach for a while now. You know, the leader or the you know the, the the chief coach, the head coach of any national team makes a huge difference to you know um, how how the trainees train, the atmosphere during training. Um, you know, he and he's proven that he's been a great great leader, and he's you know he's ma handled that role really well. Could you take us through, you know, his approach to training and you know guiding the players in general? Yeah, I think uh, the biggest uh, strength for Kenneth is uh, his ability to um, to kind of adjust to the individual player. So in men's singles, for example, he he has a lot of different playing styles in the group of players that he's working with. Me, Anas Antons, and Viktor Axelsen, Rasmus Kimk, uh, Jan uh, Jansen, and before that as well. And he, he's so good at looking at our individual needs. And then even though we are still training as a group and he needs to make some kind of a group based training, he, he just adjusts so well. So I don't feel like I'm, even though I'm not the highest uh, ranked or the one that's prioritized the highest, I don't feel like I'm wasting time just being, uh, being there to help the other guys. I'm also, I also feel like he's invested in me and he, he's, invested in, in my development. I think that's really his, his biggest strength and his ability to see what I need to work on, what Anas needs to work on, what Victor needs to work on. And it's it's very different for all of us. Um, so I, I think that's by far where he separates from all the other great coaches that I've also worked with in, in the past. Um, and I think that's also kind of his approach that when he works with someone, no matter how good or bad they are, he wants them to feel that he's invested in them. Uh, and then, of course, we are still prioritizing uh, depending on your level. So Victor does get more feedback, or he has more meetings, or he, yeah, he can he can uh, get more out of Kenneth than I can, uh, which is completely fair. And that's how a a world class system uh, needs to work. But you never feel like kind of downgraded uh, or uh, yeah, just ignored by him. If if he works with you, he's gonna invest whatever time he has possible uh, on his hands and. Uh, yeah, I think that's not not an easy uh, an easy skill to have. Also, because Kenneth, he of course he has his own way that he wanted to play the game, um, the, a, a way that he believed in was the the best one for him. But that's not the way I want to play. That's not the way Victor wants to play. So it really shows a uh, great character that he's able to to adjust to to all these uh, different playing styles that he has showed uh, for yeah the past uh, yeah, many many years now. And uh, there's this emotional connect as well. I've seen him coach side when any any of the Danish players play. You know, they they really look up to him during match. I, I've seen Victor or Anna or you. You win a match, and the first thing you go is you you go right to Kenneth. I, I mean, that is mm -hmm. special with the crop of players you've got. Uh, I mean, the term I would like to use here is man management skills, which are so good. Uh, which is something was very similar with Kim Tanner, who trained the Indian badminton double setter for a while. Uh, I feel for a coach, it's so important to leave his slash her ego, and you know, mm -hmm. as you said, try to you know take feedback from players, uh, which is something Kenneth has been doing for a while now, and that is why I feel Denmark badminton has its golden generation, especially with men's singles players. Yeah, definitely, I I completely agree. But actually, sometimes we have been uh, talking about. Uh me and Jan and Kenneth especially that this close bond we have uh, also in a few occasions can be a little bit of a weakness actually because um, sometimes we want so badly uh, to perform for Kenneth because we also know how much time and dedication and work he puts into it so if if we look uh, at him after a match that we lost a close one or an important one and we see him being really sad and disappointed it, it also like hurts us even more 
so so sometimes we we actually kind of uh, get caught up in it a little bit too much that we we want to fulfill his dreams uh, as well so so it can be a little bit of a weakness as well uh, but yeah it's it's about finding that that right uh, balance cuz cuz I, I wouldn't I wouldn't prefer him to be less invested and less personal. Um, so, so it's yeah, kind of both a a strong point, but also a, a weakness uh, sometimes, if uh, if that made sense. It's a double sided, double sided sword. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. That's a good way to put it. But but you know, some that's something we struggle with a little bit in India because. Uh, of course, the contingent is so large. We have a great volume of players, and all playing at at a great level. You know, our national circuit events are very often really competitive, and uh, we struggle to get that that um, you know that one on one attention or uh, focus from the coach because the coach to student ratio is a bit skewed. Uh, mm. But we do look, uh, you know, to countries like. Denmark for the for the way the professional approach to training to analysis to everything. I mean, we we really feel that there's a lot that India needs to come up on. Yeah, I think it's actually uh, in Denmark we are uh, we are kind of always complaining that we don't have enough funds that we are uh, we're being funded less than some of our uh, big competitors like uh, China or Japan or Indonesia. Uh, but I think one of the good things that comes out of that is that we are very effective with the uh, uh, yeah, with, with the things we do have available. Um, so we, we are trying to have a small team so that we can have very high quality. Uh, everyone can get the fee feedback that they need. Um, we're not trying to kind of uh, yeah, gather around too too many people, uh, too many players uh, in, in any way, and I, I think we just we learn to be effective with with what we have because we've kind of been forced to it over so many years that we cannot hire. Uh, 10 coaches for our national center or we can't have a, a full-time video analysis or a full-time physio or anything all of this we we just have to kind of manage with what we have and uh, yeah take it kind of uh, along the way and i i think i, I don't even think i know this is one of uh, the main differences also in the mindset of danes compared to some of our european competitors um like you you often see uh, the younger European players from other countries like Germany, England, uh, France uh, in previous days, uh, previous years, that they retire early if they don't get the funding because they don't know how to keep going in, in any way because they've been used to just getting uh, the funding that's in place and yeah. they, they don't have to take care of so much yeah. if they are at the top. Uh, we've never been used to that. Even, even a guy like Victor is not getting all his tournaments paid for. Uh, it, it's only a small percentage of it that the federation actually pays for. The rest he has to pay for himself. So we've always been used to this that we we need to find the most effective way with the the funds that we uh, yeah we have available. I, I think that's uh, of course of course we want more money and we want to have more funds available and everything. But it's not always good to. Uh, it's sometimes good to be a little bit short of money and uh, find better ways to uh, to make do with uh, what you have. Yeah, absolutely spot on. Um, coming to uh, a very favorite uh, part of my conversation, is every era has uh, you know a lot of good players, but I feel you've been part of an era which has got six of best players to have ever played the game. So you've got Lin Dan, you've got Lee Chong Wei, you've got Chen Jin, who was also a brilliant player, but always under the shadow of Lin Dan. You had Peter Gid. You had Taufik, and you you also had a very young Chen Long coming up the ranks. How tough was it to be, you know, a part of that era? And you know, what did you do to evolve, uh, you know, during your time with them? Mm. Well, of course, it's uh, like it's an honor to be able to play guys like uh, Li Chen Wei and then Peter Gader, uh, yeah, guys like that. Taufik, even uh, I only played him at the very end of his career, but. I think it's really cool to be able to say that I've uh, I've played against them and I've played against Chong Wei when they played at their best, uh, and I've also given them some good fights. I've also been basically humiliated on court by them, uh, but that, that's fine. I, I don't I don't mind that. Um, but but to be honest, Lin Dan and uh, Lee Chong Wei are uh, two guys I really uh, admire and take some inspiration from with the age I have now, because uh, both of those those guys kept on going for for so long. And what I think is is really cool about Lin Dan is something that a lot of fans actually criticized him a little bit for that he kept on playing even though his level uh, wasn't what it used to be. 
but to me, he kept on playing because he thought it was fun to play badminton. He enjoyed playing badminton. He enjoyed the competition. Yeah. And that's exactly why I play badminton and I, why I want to keep on going. I, as you said, Tanvi, in the uh, in the presentation of me, I used to be ranked top 10 in the world. I, I, I don't right now, uh, but I have no plans of uh, of quitting because of that. Yeah. Uh, it, it will be other reasons uh, that, that makes me quit uh, in the end. So so I take a lot of inspiration from Lindan and Cheng Wei. I think it's, it's admirable that they kept on going for so long. Uh, and uh, yeah, I want to kind of follow in their footsteps. I would like to do that with the sauce as well, but I, I think that's a bit too late for me now. <laughs> the show is titled The Millennial Athlete. And, you know, as millennials, um, uh, it's it's very easy today to get you know with with all the social media and the glamour element to sport especially in in a country like india it's so easy for the younger lot to get carried away with you know the the glamour or the the photo shoots and the money that's coming in you know sindhu winning and they're seeing uh, you know that side of it and uh, but but it's it's so important you know shlok is now mentoring a few kids and coaching a few youngsters and uh, you know it's it's so important to to ingrain that fact in them that it starts with enjoying the sport you you can't get so carried away with uh, the other side of things that you forget to actually love the sport and actually you know that's that's what keeps you going for uh, for the longest of time yeah, it's, I totally agree. And always when I get asked uh, if I have one good advice for uh, young players or, or anyone playing badminton, I always say just to have fun. And it's not like you have to laugh all the time and run around and think everything is just uh, uh, yeah, easy and everything. Of course, it has to be hard times and uh, hard trainings as well. But in the end, it has to be fun. I really believe that if it if you don't find it fun anymore, you you won't enjoy it and you won't produce the results that you're you're capable of. Uh, but that being said, of course, money and glamour and fame and stuff like that can be a very legitimate uh, form of uh, motivation. Uh, I don't discount that in, in any way, but I just think it cannot stand alone as the only motivation. You, you need to also find a way to enjoy what you're doing by, by actually uh, having fun. And I think that's not specific for badminton. I think that's uh, for any, any line of work, basically, uh, in life. Yeah. This is what has happened to a lot of athletes as well, right? Uh, when they're not having fun on court, uh, there's a different side to them. They're, they're frustrated and nothing seems to be going right. And, and I've seen a similar phase happening to you where you were just not enjoying your time on court and you were having first round losses, but then you went, went back to the drawing board. You said, okay, and I'm going to have fun, new goals, new targets. And uh, you know that is what maybe experience does to you. you know, the more experience you get, uh, you start to understand your game and your mind a little bit more. Yeah, definitely. And uh, the, the question you also brought up before about how I, I needed to evolve over, over the years, uh, that there's no doubt that I've had to rethink my game many times. Uh, I've been traveling on the tour since I was uh, 19. And yeah, as I said, I'm, I'm 35 now. So of course, uh, I need to evolve because the game is evolving. Um, men's singles is not being played the same way now uh, as it was uh, 15 years ago or even just five or six years ago. Um, so, so you kind of need to evolve all the time and it's completely normal uh, to experience these down periods where the results are, are really bad. We, we can't all be Chong Wei, Lindan, Momota that just keeps on uh, winning all the titles. That's very, very few players who actually, uh, who actually do that. Um, so yeah, for me, it's been pretty natural to kind of uh, find new maturation all the time to evolve my game. Uh, but that being said, it hasn't been easy. I've had uh, really tough times in my career as well. And uh, times where it's not been easy to find that um, enjoyment in, in playing, especially when the results has not followed uh, suit compared to my expectations. So it's, it sounds easy, but it, of course, as you guys also know, it, it's not that simple uh, to, to make it work that way. Absolutely. You've got that spot on. Um, on that note, we take our first break. Uh, on the on the other side of the break, we talk what makes Wittingis such a great mentor. And we go back uh, to his big Thomas Cup victory. Uh, stay tuned, guys. We've got a lot more to chat about. Stay tuned. You're listening to The Millennial Athlete with Tanvi and Shlok. We'll be right back. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Three... Two, one. Welcome back. You're listening to the Millennial Athlete with Tanvi and Shlok. We still have Hans Christian Solberg Wittingus with us. Hans, uh, let's go back to China and your uh, big Thomas Cup victory. I know it meant 
so much uh, for the team because I was watching the match, uh, you know, in my in TV screen. And you went in to play that deciding third singles uh, against a really young upcoming Isan Molana Mustafa, who was, who was a top 20 player at that point of time. You know, what did you, what did you think uh, before going into such a high pressure match? Well, first of all, I was obviously I'm a little bit nervous. Uh, there, there's no uh, point in, in trying to hide that in any way. Uh, it was a huge match for uh, not just for me, but for Danish badminton. We had lost eight Thomas Cup finals, uh, yeah, over the course of uh, badminton history since 1949. Uh, we've never won the gold medal. There was kind of a curse over Danish badminton that we could just not get that gold. Uh, and obviously, I knew if I won, we uh, we would finally win it. So I was obviously very nervous, uh, very nervous. Um, but I also remember that uh, I had worked a lot with my uh, mental coach leading up to the Thomas Cup um, on this exact um, uh, circumstance that I would be the deciding match in a uh, deciding match, semi-final, quarter-final, whatever uh, final. Um, because we knew that I was going to be third singles, and usually third singles is the deciding match yeah. in uh, in the uh, knockout knockout games. Um, so I also reminded Kenneth just before we went on, uh, right before I went through the uh, player tunnel and on court, I told him, Kenneth, this is the moment that we prepare for. So now, now it's all about going in and doing what we agreed to do. Uh, that doesn't mean that it was easy for me to go in and do it, but we just needed to remind each other that this was the exact moment that we prepared for. All the hard work that we had done in the previous months was leading up to this very moment. Um, so I knew I was ready, I knew I was prepared for it. So that kind of gave me a, a sense of, a, a little bit of sense of relief and security that if I did trust the game plan, and the work that we had done, then I would have a very good chance of winning. I was obviously also a very good player at the time. I think I was ranked 10, 11 or 12 um, myself at the time. Um, so that also gave me some confidence that if I could play my game, I would have a, a good chance. Uh, but it's still hard to kind of just uh, wash away all the nervous feelings. And uh, if you look at the match, I also think my level uh, of play rises a lot after the first interval at 11 10 in the first yeah, game the, yeah. the start of the match is not, is not brilliant but after 11 10 i think i'm playing especially considering the situation i'm playing some amazing badminton uh, ranks as your best moment on court so far that yeah. Yeah. The line smash. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the easiest questions i can ever get and just talking about it i'm i still get goosebumps, like goosebumps and, uh, it's yeah uh, it's an amazing feeling and uh, i know that uh, that will also go down in history for when I retire, that that's what people are going to remember me for. And uh, I have no issue with that. That's absolutely fine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all of us are very fortunate uh, to have represented uh, our respective nations at the Thomas and Uber Cups. Uh, but uh, you've had uh, the chance to actually, you know, ha hold the Thomas Cup. Uh, so that uh, makes it even more special. Uh, so yeah, yeah so once and, again, and yeah. Yeah, and not, not just the actual feeling on court and lifting the trophy, but everything that went on afterwards when we got to the airport. <laughs> there were so many of the old Thomas Cup heroes that went there to greet us. We had uh, Alan Cups, who was uh, yeah one of the uh, best players back in the uh, in the sixties. I think he won eight All England titles or seven All England titles. Um, yeah, we had uh, Peter Gade. Uh, we had Morten Frost greeting us. We there were so many. Uh, of the old greats that sent us messages and just it just showed how much it, it meant to not not only us but also all the previous teams that that failed to get that uh, yeah, elusive gold medal uh, back home so it was it was an experience that i will never forget and all my teammates will uh, never forget it either these are definitely moments uh, that sportsmen live for I mean, hmm. more than your personal, sure. I mean, as singles players, sometimes I, I feel, you know, we, we get a bit selfish because we're always thinking about our needs and our rankings and our training. And then sometimes when you, when you win something for the nation, it's, it's a different feeling altogether. Yeah. And what made it even more special that week for us was also the fact that we had 10 players on the team and all 10 of them won a important match during uh, the week. Uh, some of the some of the teams sometimes they will have one or two guys that are mainly just reserves and they don't get to play a match and maybe you don't feel 
that you're part of it the same way. Mm. But all ten of us had to play one very important match at the, uh, one point during the tournament, and we won the final uh, four matches three two. So we couldn't have made do without any uh, any of the guys. We were all uh, important for the team that week. Yeah, on that note, Emu was beating Darren Liu in that <laughs> Malaysian tie. I mean, that that just shows. Uh, you know, ME host might not have beaten Darren Liu in an individual event if you look there head to head, but ME uh, host to come and do that on the Thomas Cup stage just shows how much it means uh, for the players to represent their team. Then you just get an additional gear to your game. Yeah, definitely. It was it was an absolutely crazy match, the one against Malaysia. It, uh, it was even more crazy than the final. The final. It was a final, of course, and it has its own life. But the Malaysia match was really, really a. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't even know how to describe it. It was just unbelievable. It was so crazy down 2-0 and getting back and uh, beating them. It's a proud Thomas Cup nation, much prouder than Denmark. They have uh, won in the past as well. So, yeah, that was unbelievable. And having to play without Jan, as you said, that uh, Emil, he had to play the, the deciding match. And he had never played anything like that before. <laughs> and then go in and, and win it. That's, that's pretty unbelievable. Amazing. Um, so uh, Hans, actually, we chatted uh, about this uh, on our previous episode when we when we spoke about uh, Rafa Nadal being, uh, you know, the ultimate uh, icon for millennials in terms of um, his on court and off court persona. Uh, you know, uh, when we look at you um, as a badminton player, that's the so you know to to us juniors as well uh, that. Besides being a top level athlete, your, your off court persona is is something that really strikes out. Um, you know your 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 nature, your uh, your friendly. Your, you have a really pleasant persona off court as well. How important do you do you regard that uh, fr from an athlete's perspective? Yeah, well, thanks a lot for <laughs> those nice words. That that makes me very uh, happy and uh, proud to hear as well. Actually. Um, I think for me it's very important because I I really try to be the best version of myself and I also try to be uh, the person that I am towards everybody uh, and not just uh, my friends or my colleagues on the Danish team but I, I want to just be Hans Christian uh, like I am to fans or uh, fellow players from other countries and uh, yeah just just to everyone and I see myself as a very open-minded person um, one of the things I actually enjoy the most about playing badminton is the fact that I get to travel the world and meet different cultures uh, learn about what it's like to be from India for example or be from Malaysia or Indonesia or uh, Canada or whatever um, I think that that's one of the biggest blessings from playing international badminton that I've ha had the chance to do that over so many years um, it, it it would be a lie if I said that it's not something I, I think about, but it comes pretty natural uh, to me. And I, I think it's just uh, over the years I've learned so much from being this kind of persona that's very open-minded. Uh, it's it's given me so much great friendships, great discussions, uh, a chance to be part of uh, the Millennial Podcast, for example. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just given me a lot of uh, options and uh, yeah, n nice uh, learnings and opportunities. So so it's only natural for me to. To really try and seek it even more because it's uh, yeah, it's opened up opportunities for me, um, and it is the person I am. So I'm not going to change it, um, and it also goes hand in hand with a lot of the athletes that I admire admire the most. Uh, Rafa is not one of them. Uh, I never really liked him, but that's mostly because Roger Federer is my hero, and Rafa, is, uh, of course, the biggest opponent. But I have to say that I really I really like the. Like the person Rafa Nadal, but uh, I just don't like the tennis player because uh, he's <laughs> he's won too many titles that I think Roger should uh, should have won. So. Um, okay, one of the things which has also you know struck me you know a couple of years back is that you've also taken your wife's uh, name as part of your name, which is now which, which was earlier Hans Christian Wittingus, and it's now Hans Christian Solberg Wittingus. How has marriage affected your career in a good way? Obviously, she's also professional athlete in her own right and has had a phenomenal career how has it been like marrying somebody who's also been you know at a very high level in in a different sport though but how the how is the whole marriage thing affected your uh, you know your mental approach to the game i think uh, that's uh, it's a good question but there's uh, there's a lot that i've gained from my, my wife because she, we are very 
different in terms of our mental approach. Uh, my wife is uh, not a thinker in any way uh, that I am. Like I, I tend to overthink a lot of things. Um, that's also why sometimes uh, I completely lose the plot on court because I think too much about consequences and what if I do and what if I do that. And yeah, uh, my wife is much more uh, a person that just, she just does uh, things like, uh, like she doesn't think about tomorrow or anything. She just goes out there and then she, she does it. Uh, and I, I think we've actually, uh, we learned a lot from each other there. Also in terms of our off court demeanor, because uh, she's also a person that just, she says whatever that comes to mind, uh, sometimes without thinking too much about it. And I, I, I'm the opposite that I, I think again so much before I, I speak. And I, I think I learned a lot from her that sometimes it's it's okay to be uh, a bit more impulsive and just, just uh, reacting instead of uh, over analyzing uh, everything. Um, so I, I've learned a lot from my coach in that way. And I think it's a big advantage actually that she's not a badminton player, but she's from a completely different sport. Um, there's not a lot of similarities between uh, dressage, uh, that, that's that's a sport that she's uh, into, uh, but between that and, and badminton, uh, but it is still competition. Uh, so there are also some things that we can uh, we can compare and, uh, and learn from each other. Uh, so I would say marriage has uh, has been good for my career. Getting a child is a different story. <laughs> <laughs> also, fatherhood. Uh, baby Vincent is growing. Uh, how old is he now? He is uh, turning three next month. So it's uh, yeah, he's uh, coming a big boy soon. <laughs> yeah, how how is how is fatherhood, uh, you know, affected you? Multitasking, game, so. I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I wouldn't change it for the world. That's for sure. Uh, I love him to pieces. That little, uh, yeah, the little guy. Um, but I also have to be uh, honest and say that it it has made it more difficult for me to do all the things that I wanted or felt like I needed to do before um, in terms of uh, both sleep and training and stuff like that. It would be easier if I had a wife that just put everything on hold and uh, I could just focus on my thing. But it's never been like that because she's also uh, an athlete and she also wants to, to focus on her career. We do have an agreement that my career is uh, like the, the highest priority right now also because she can keep on going for many years. Uh, age is not a a limiting factor for her um but it, it, it has limited some things uh but again as i said i would change it for the world uh, uh on the contrary i would like to have more kids actually um, so that also just shows me that there are some things that are more important than badminton in life and uh, that that's family uh, for sure um but yeah i i can't really say that having him has uh, been beneficial in some way for my career uh, uh, it's it's just the truth. Uh, I don't know if it sounds uh, harsh or anything. It's not meant in a harsh way. It's just uh, natural in terms of how me and my wife's life uh, is is set up. But he, but he just makes you so happy, right? So everything uh, after you go back to a tournament, you just go to him. You just mentally just forget all of your losses and anything. You just go look at his happy face, and you're like, okay, the world is such a happy place now. <laughs> and they're so innocent. Definitely. <laughs> Yeah, that, that part is uh, much easier now that I, I have something to go back to. Uh, but it also makes it a little bit harder when I'm then gone that I, I, I miss him so much. But it's it's amazing to have that feeling that you can just go home to him and he, he doesn't care at all if I won or lost. Uh, and the few times he's been able to be at the stadium when I played for the Nationals, for example, there's no better feeling than uh, going off court and then just uh, seeing him coming uh, running to me and uh, uh, give me a big hug. That's that's one of the most amazing feelings in uh, in the world. Awesome. Um, I think I just had one last question for you, uh, which is uh, regarding two of uh, my favorite episodes uh, from your podcast, a year on tour with uh, with yeah. Ingos, which is um, one is a very personal question. I mean, your your episode with Tina Tina Bon, uh, where she she mentioned that she had to spar with the guys very often, and uh, you used to spar with her, and you know you would uh, how would you make uh, make a session out of it? I mean, of course you you were playing at a different pace, and but you you had to get a get a good game and ensure that you know you were you were. Uh, helping her out as well. So, what what was your approach as a men's singles player getting into a training session with a women's singles player? Yeah, I, I love that question because uh, I, I think that's something uh, some men's singles players often misunderstand that if they uh, go on court with the women's singles, they feel uh, 
less prioritized and they feel like it's basically uh, in some ways a waste of their time and it, it's not like that at all there's so many things that you can work on even though you're playing with someone who obviously doesn't play at the same pace uh, just because of the physical abilities that's that's only natural uh, but with tina uh, especially she she had a really nice attack she had so many good shots from the uh, back of the court so whenever i went on court with her I had the mindset that okay now it's time for me to work on uh, on two things one is my defense so i played it a bit more defensively uh, unless she told me that i had to play in a certain uh, playing style but usually i would play a bit more defensive to work on that and then i focused a lot on uh, on cutting out any mistakes because that is one thing that you can always work on just not make any mistakes if you can't do it when you play in the pace that's a little bit lower than normal then why would you believe that you can do it against the guys that, that play even faster um, so, and you also know that uh, i also knew that every time i went on court with tina or if i do it with lina kersfeld and mia blickfeld now that they give 100 percent every time there's no doubt because they know that they need to be at their best to give me a, yeah a, a good training session so you are ensured a 100% uh, effort from, from the other player. Uh, and yeah, there's many things you can use that for. Even if you have something that you're working on in terms of uh, your, your mental game, um, that's also a brilliant uh, area to, to try and put those uh, things into uh, a, an actual game uh, situation. Because uh, it, it is obviously a little bit easier to do things when the, the pace is a little bit slower than usual. Um, but you, you might as well get as much out of it as you can. Because uh, if you don't, then in the end, it's not Tina or uh, the girl that's wasting your time. It's yourself that, that's wasting the time. Uh, it, it's not her. Uh, yeah, so that's always been my approach. And I have to say that I, I enjoyed a lot training with Tina. Because she always, always well, she was always in such a good mood. Uh, she always, uh, in training, just gave everything. and. Uh, we, we had a lot of fun battles, uh, and I always made sure also to make it a close one. So we, uh, we played 22-20 or 23-21 in the end. Uh, and uh, yeah, a few times I, I lost because I, I took it too far. And uh, as I said, she had some really nice shots. So sometimes she, uh, she also caught me uh, uh, off guard a little bit. OK, um, so my final uh, two questions are, uh, you're a thinking guy. Uh, you always think ahead. Uh, I know you're gonna you're fit enough to play for another two seasons, three seasons for sure. Uh, but uh, what plans in the future? Uh, I hope someday. Yeah, I have a small dream that uh, you know uh, we could uh, co-commentate on the VWF tour someday. Or uh, uh, I do feel that you would also be a fantastic coach. But what have you thought uh, in the future moving ahead? Yeah, but that's definitely two areas that I have uh, thought about. Uh, I uh, I want to be coaching in some. Uh, way a capacity. Uh, I don't think as soon as I quit that I will start coaching and traveling the world as a national team coach. Uh, I, I want to have more time at home. So I will start off by coaching uh, at uh, maybe junior level or just high senior level in, in Denmark. Uh, that's at least my plan. But I also kind of plan that when I quit playing international tournaments, I still want to play badminton. I love it too much to stop. So I want to play some leagues in uh, Denmark, in Europe, even uh, PBL if they uh, want me and it's, it's still around. Uh, so I, I want to keep on playing for as long as possible and then maybe just do some part-time coaching. Uh, in terms of commentary, it would be amazing to come uh, commentate on the world tour. Uh, I've tried it once with the with the uh, Jillian uh, Clark. Jillian. Jill Clark. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, I've also done it twice at the Olympics for Danish uh, national TV, uh, which has been amazing experiences. And working within that field, uh, yeah, the field of media, that, that will also be quite nice. And to be honest, my podcast uh, uh, is also, I also see that as a kind of a tr training or a learning experience uh, yeah. towards that. Yeah. Um, a stepping stone. I, I, yeah, exactly. Exactly. I have a few ideas about podcasting that I would like to. Uh, see out in the uh, future as well. Uh, I think there's a, a market for it, even though visual uh, things are maybe bigger nowadays. So there's also a market for, for podcasts. So that's also an area that I want to explore a bit more when uh, when I retire from international badminton. OK, uh, so final question. Your five picks, uh, five youngsters who are you know ones to look out in the next couple of seasons. So it could be any, any event. Yeah five your five names who you could think that you know are going to be the ones to watch out 
Yeah, well, I've I've had a lot of experience playing one of them, and that's uh, Laksha Sen. <laughs> uh, I played him both in the uh, Danish league. I played him in Malaysia Masters last year, and I played him in Denmark Open. And uh, even though I won all of them, which is important, uh, I, uh, <laughs> I, I think he's really a guy to watch out for in the future. He's so so fast, and I think there's nothing he can't do. He can play offense, he can play fast, he can play slow, he can play defense, he can play net. Uh, he he already has a very complete game for a guy who's still a teenager. Uh, so I expect uh, if he wants it enough, I th expect him to be a world class player in the uh, in the future. Um, and he's probably going to fight with this Thai guy, uh, Kunlavut uh, Vititsan. Who I think did he win three world juniors in a row, two or three? Yeah. 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 <laughs> he's going to if he's another, if he's a, if he's junior another year he's going to win that also. He's, he's that good. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's really good. We also discussed it on Twitter the other day. I, th I think he he's also a guy that has a very complete game. Uh, he looks more fit now than uh, that was my one concern about him actually that he didn't look so fit uh, when he was a junior. But if he can get that part uh, going as well, I, I think he's also uh, one for the future. Uh, in women's singles, uh, yeah, I'm also going to go with one of the obvious ones, but An Si Young from Korea. Um, I, I really don't see how she's not going to become top two, three in the world at some point. Uh, I think the only reason why she wouldn't is because w the women's singles field is stronger than it has ever been before. It's, uh, of course, I'm a men's singles guy, so I enjoy men's singles the most, but I would, being fair, I would actually say that women's singles is maybe the most intriguing uh, discipline at the moment because it's a very diverse uh, field of, of players they have. All the players in top 10, they have different playing styles. They have different personalities. We have um, different countries. Uh, that's that's very rare to see that we have players from from so many different countries and yeah and so young she is uh, she's up against tough competition but when you see her play there's just no doubt in my mind that she will be a a, a future top player uh, in terms of the doubles categories it's a bit harder for me I don't watch it as much uh, but uh, yeah, given how these uh, Indonesian guys did in uh, Thailand open uh, Leo yeah. and uh, Leo Bernardo and Daniel Martin. Yeah, exactly. Watching them play this week was quite a, re a revelation. Um, actually, it's, it's quite fun that uh, um, Kim Estrup and Anna Skorup on the Danish team, before we left for, for this event, we were talking about how to draw. And yeah, first week, it was pretty tough. They had to play uh, Wang Chilin and, uh, and uh, Yang Li. But then they said that second tournament is, is quite good because they have these uh, young uh, Indonesian guys and they played them once before and uh, of course they had respect for them and everything. But yeah, then we see this week they just beat uh, everyone and, uh, and make it to the semifinals. So I think they're a bit more reluctant now to say that it's a, a good call playing those two guys. So I, I expect a lot from them also just based on the fact that they're from Indonesia and if you want to become a good men's doubles player I think there's no better place to, uh, to learn uh, with great with playing, everyone uh, can with serve and, and uh, everyone serve, yeah. serving service and receiving is is on point I think they learn it yeah from... exactly, exactly and if you train every day with Asan Sergevan Kevin Marcus uh, yeah. Alfian and yeah, you have Christian Hadinata as a coach then uh, I, I really don't see why you would not become a, a world class player again if you want it badly enough uh, that's that's always uh, what's going to stop people in, in that case or injuries of course but uh, let, let's not hope for that for any of the, those guys i mentioned there danish player to look out for your one danish pick in the next couple of scenes to look out for uh, we have a men's singles player left-handed guy marmus johannesson yeah uh, he copies uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually a little bit sad that I didn't mention Krista Popov amongst my five guys to watch out for. I think he's going to be a really nice uh, men's singles player as well from France. But Maunus Johannesson, he's, uh, I think he's going to be very good. He's been training with us. He started training at the National Center with us. Uh, he comes over a, yeah, one, two weeks at a time. And uh, he's really shown in training already that he has a very high level. He beat Anna Santos at the Nationals last year and uh, almost beat me as well. Luckily, he didn't. Uh, I, I, I seem to have a good grasp of how to beat these young guys, luckily, uh, but <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm very confident in uh, Danish men's singles. Uh, Victor, Anas, Gemke are still young in my eyes, all of them. Uh, and yeah, we have uh, Maunus coming up and also a guy from my own club called Meshul Müller, who's actually just came uh, up to the first place in the World Junior Rankings. Uh, okay. we, are, we are well set in, in men's singles for many years to come and uh, I expect us, uh, I, I expect Denmark to be a force uh, in men's singles uh, for the next 
uh, 10 15 years as well okay on that note uh, this is where we end uh, good luck uh, for your uh, upcoming match uh, against louis enrique penevlar uh, i hope and we hope that you win that and you go extremely deep through the tournament and after you win we will put the out the post saying that it is because of us and a podcast that he's gone right uh, uh, deep but yeah jokes apart thank you so much i know you got a busy schedule with your preparation so yeah thank you so much it has been a pleasure talking to you guys and uh, i'll uh... I'll be sure to thank you guys if I uh, if I stand on the podium on Sunday. I will uh, send you guys a special thanks. Awesome. I can do that. Awesome. <laughs> on that note, uh, we come to an end of another brilliant episode of the Millionaire Athlete with Tanvi and Shlok. Uh, if you like this podcast, please uh, you can also check out Hans Christian Wittinger's podcast. It's called A Year on the Tour with Wittinger. You can find find it on his profile. So please do give it a listen as well. Uh, if you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can listen to all of them on the IVM podcast app or ivmpodcast.com. You can also follow IVM on on their social media handle that is at the rate IVM podcast on Twitter and Instagram. If you if you want to reach out to me, please do. Uh, you can find me on Instagram and Twitter with the handle s h l o k h ninety five. And uh, you can find me uh, on the handle at tanvila nine three on Instagram and Twitter. And Hans, where can our listeners find you? It's uh, HK Wiedinghus. Uh, I don't want to spell that out if they don't. Uh, <laughs> don't do that, it's, it's fine. Don't even bother. But yeah, both on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, just uh, search for HK uh, Wiedinghus, and then they should be able to find me. Cool. Until then, ciao. We shall be back very soon with another fresh episode of the Millionaire Athlete with Tanvi and Shlok. Thank you, everyone.